Hey, what's up, beautiful people? We got another amazing episode of the Silicon Valley to Spirituality Show. Psychedelics, spirituality, what people do after raves are over. Well, we discuss all these things along with parenting, some entrepreneurship. So why don't we jump into the podcast? But before we do, if you enjoy what you're hearing, if you love the guests, please, please feel free to leave a comment, leave a review, follow this channel, share it with a friend. I would really greatly appreciate any help in growing this channel. And without further ado, let's jump into the... All right, everybody, how is everyone doing? This is Sabo Shen with another beautiful episode of the Silicon Valley to Spirituality Show. This week, I have an amazing guest, Rob Sanchez. He is the founder of Apartment 113. He is also the chief product officer of Toke, a point of sale application in the cannabis industry. Rob, thank you so much for joining the show. Sabo, man, thank you for having me. Happy to be here, dude, and nice work on the show so far. Ah, thank you so much. I really appreciate guests that actually listen to a few episodes before they come on. And as a person that does not have a lot of hair, I got to say, I have a lot of hair envy looking <laughs> at your uh, uh, image in my computer right now. Hey, my last haircut was maybe February 2016. I'm I'm trying to go the distance there and make it 10 years. <laughs> well, I have a feeling you could do it. So um, before we jump into our conversation, you know, I want the audience to just to get to know you a little bit better. Can you tell them a little bit about Apartment 113 and a little bit of your past and origin story of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, the origin story, how my, my mutant powers evolved. Um, <laughs> no, I started in, uh, so I started in the cultivation space for cannabis after graduating from K-State, um, grew up in Kansas, and throughout that, cannabis was demonized. It was not a thing. There were all kinds of minor infractions that could, could get you caught up. So I'm happy to have survived that, but I was eager to get out into a legal space. So I was cultivating and making some hash uh, for my first jobs in the industry in 2012 to 2014 times. Um, after that, I kind of fell back on my original career dream. So I was trying to get into tech and software. And I got involved in a software company in Minneapolis and actually exited the cannabis industry uh, for a little while and kind of built up my career on the software side. Um, over time, I became a consultant for what are called ERPs. So enterprise resource planning systems that let you do manufacturing, supply chain kind of stuff, all the financials that businesses need to stay online. And that was taking me around the country. Um, I went to Kansas City again and then up to Seattle and was just kind of bouncing around there. And it was maybe around 2016 or 17, I realized that some cannabis specific ERPs were being built in the space and starting to be leveraged while uh, the industry matured. This was a calling, man. It was like, here it is. I found the cross section of my interests. I need to apply. And I just sent like personal messages to all the CEOs and founders I could find and got started at 365 Cannabis. I was um, employee 11 there and moved down to Las Vegas where I'm still at today. And uh, it was a journey since then. Uh, really working on the on cannabis ERPs was exciting, but also challenging because the general the general vibes weren't very cannabis friendly. But I was definitely coming at it as a stoner, as a cannabis connoisseur. So I was sort of riding that line and acting as kind of a go-between between, between uh, the businesses and then our more tech-focused or financial-focused uh, software companies. I got into traveling with 365 Cannabis and ended up spending a lot of time in Canada, um, implementing for some big grows up there and helping them use the software. But the travel vibes in that game started to weigh me down. It was hard. I would go out for maybe Monday through Thursday up to Canada, come back on a Thursday night, have Friday, Saturday, Sunday to wash my clothes, and then fly back to Canada again. I uh, did it for maybe a little over three months, and then it was time to, time to find something new. Uh, so I played my, my game again, and I ended up at Viridian Sciences, which is also an ERP in the cannabis space. And I was a value engineer there, helping them kind of perfect the solution and um, kind of make it right for cannabis. Um, Viridian was based on a system called SAP Business One, 
and uh, it was a solid ERP, great backbone there, but it uh, wasn't right, wasn't quite right for the cannabis space yet. So that was what my focus was at the time. And um, while that company grew, we were eventually acquired by Akerna, which was kind of the mothership of cannabis software for many years. Um, they've since exited the space, and I think they focus more on crypto now. But they acquired Viridian Sciences, and then they acquired 365 Cannabis. Uh, so it was crazy. I would like came at, back into my first companies just through the acquisitions. And like some acquisitions go, it was bumpy. There was a lot of kind of misunderstanding about what the apps could do, what was possible, and maybe there wasn't very much clarity around what they truly purchased. Um, in hindsight, I think we could say Akerna was buying doors rather than products, just buying up the customers and those recurring fees and maybe not caring as much about the, the space. So I was doing that and actually I felt like, hey man, this is a good step. Now I know both these ERPs, Microsoft and SAP, let me help sunset them and build a better one. So the plan was to actually build one from scratch. And um, out of As Life Goes, there were some surprises in there. And I was moved to help with Ample Organics, a previous purchase from Akerna that happened to be based in Canada. <laughs> So I was going back north and working on the Canadian market again with my passion all being here in the U.S. I did it for a little while and then eventually found my way over to Blaze Point of Sale. And I, for Blaze, I built their manufacturing side of the business and also managed their cultivation and distribution, doing things with metric and inventory management, all that fun stuff. Uh, and I was unfortunately part of a layoff at Blaze um, in let's see 2023 it was last year in january i think and it was no warning no conversation and two weeks before my daughter was born so it was kind of like a like a, oh shit wow. kind of moment man and uh i you know i had spun up apartment 113 as a consultancy to just help with operations help people find software and th that layoff was a catalyst to pour the fuel on, man, push the go button. So I started the podcast, started blogging regularly, and really just started to lean into the business itself and using it as a platform to provide contracted product management. So instead of kind of be at the whims of these larger companies, try to just come in and do like a task and leave. Um, so I, I did that for a little while until I got involved with Toke Point of Sale, which is where I'm at now and uh, where I'm I'm happy to be at. Uh, it was a journey for sure, but over at Toke, I've been able to really build off of some of my knowledge and experience and start to prepare um, a, an excellent platform. We just went live with it this year and we're like planning some state by state expansions and really getting the wheels spinning. But um, in the meantime, throughout that, man, I've got 84 episodes on the podcast so far and been able to really talk with a lot of people long form. Um, the name Apartment 113 comes from my apartment in Minneapolis, which was unsurprisingly apartment 113. Uh, it was a it was a sweet little spot we had there and we had some wonderful after parties. So we would invite people after the shows, after the bass music or the bars close to come out and ride their trips out at apartment 113 because <laughs> uh, it's often hard to go to sleep, you know, at 2 a.m. essentially hosting the afters. Um, I had a, a cool roommate at the time that was kind of wheeling and dealing in the psychedelic space. So I fell into that game for a while and we had some just wonderful folks in and out of the apartment. Um, it surprised me because of the, I, I guess, the caliber of people and the character of folks I met through that. You think almost like these late night after parties get a little rough and tumble. You know, you see like these clubs and things, but it was a different vibe entirely. It was very low key. It was all about just playing music, painting on the floor and hanging out man, until the sun rose. I mean, I remember waking up one time and some girls that were staying uh, had actually cleaned my kitchen before they left. So it's just like people were very kind, man. It was awesome. It was a good way to really connect with the space. And like leading up to that point, I was just so work focused really my head down, kind of living the workaholic life. And uh, it allowed me to open up like to the community and kind of realize what I was missing, you know, both that setting of apartment 113 and 
dabbling in and out of psychedelics. Uh, so when I moved away from there and got even deeper into cannabis software, I missed it. And so I started going to conferences to try and get that same social vibe, but it, it wasn't always as easy to have like a long form conversation at a conference. You know, you're shaking hands, giving a business card. Is there value here for us to talk further? Yes or no. Uh, move on to the next guy. Uh, so the podcast was spun up to really have those long form conversations that I used to have um, back in the good old days. And uh, yeah, it's a good way to kind of let the business mask fall away and connect with folks. Um, kind of around the time that that catalyst happened of getting laid off, I uh, met Dustin over at Fat Nugs Magazine. And this was before Fat Nugs Magazine was a magazine. It started actually as a, um, an image that he would put together every week with kind of a like um, ironic uh, headline or, you know, poking fun at some of the news and the things in the cannabis space. Well, en enough people asked him about it, including myself, to contribute that it uh, actually pushed it over the line that it became a magazine. So I was able to do some really early contributions there, um, writing about microdosing, um, doing some strain reviews, and uh, we went to Coral Cove and was able to write about that. We recently did the Ganja Cup, um, done a few other events with them too. So it was a good way to start uh, getting into the cannabis journalism side of things and blogging. But yeah, man, I think that brings us to kind of to today. I'm spinning a ton of projects at the same time. I'm one of those guys that likes to have just everything in the fire and just kind of make my way through them because you never know which one's really going to catch. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that intro. And um, I I'm glad you brought up Fat Nugs. I was going to ask about that because that's how you got on my radar. I was just kind of flipping through LinkedIn, awesome, saw a bunch of Dustin's posts, was wondering what Fat Nugs magazine was, and then read about you going to Jamaica, Coral Cove, and I was like, oh man, this guy seems really interesting. I just clicked the button below your name, went to Apartment 113's website, checked it out, and I was like, oh man, I think this guy, probably a kindred spirit, so I reached out to you, and here we are. And man, there were so many things about your intro story that resonated with me, you know, and I wanted to interrupt you so many times, but I have a bad habit of doing that. That's what my wife always tells me when I get excited. But, you know, there was like these these really organic um, opportunities that just sprang up, like, you know, like you telling Dustin about like his weekly digital thing, like if you could contribute it to it, then it becomes a magazine. There was also um, getting laid off with no notice um, right before you had your kid. But then that was the genesis of the podcast and then you having these really great long form conversations. And, you know, I've often been asked like, you know, what, what is my main goal with this podcast? And I've tried to like monetize like a lot of different things in the past. And for this particular project, I just said, you know, if, if I get to speak to people for an hour uninterrupted to me, that is a win, you know, that rarely happens and kind of yeah. counterintuitively, um, this podcast has grown quicker than pretty much every other project that I've done where I was like really <laughs> trying to figure out like a path to monetization. And, you know, where I would like to kind of steer the conversation is to the area where you were talking about these late night parties, but then they weren't like these you know, I was imagining kind of like what I used to do after coming home from a rave, which was, you know, get even like more faded at home because I knew I didn't have to drive and then eventually pass out. <laughs> but then you were talking about what sounded to me like very intentional um, uh, experiences with some sort of plant medicine and then really kind of like hosting the downtime uh, when people are outside of the club and just having these amazing conversations or people doing art, you know, can you elaborate a little bit more about these, these, uh, sessions? Yeah, for sure, man. Definitely. Um, so I, it, in Minneapolis, I, I had been moving around so much for work. I didn't know folks. So I was just going to these raves and these, you know, bass shows. I like psychedelic bass music a lot, the wubs and the dubs. Um, so I met a dude there and, um, we just, bumped into each other a few times, may or may not have exchanged some Molly and other substances. And uh, eventually I needed a roommate and I just put out like a general call uh, just to the like Facebook and just my social media. And he popped up again. He needed a place to stay. 
And um, shout out to Nelson because uh, he's kind of the, the part of the heart and soul of Apartment 113 because together we really hosted, yeah, some great spots, man. We kind of converted the main room to a really chill space with kind of, you know, nice mood lighting. Uh, we hung up like a lot of banners and posters. We had tarot cards out, like a lot of things to play with and, you know, some good speakers and music. And it really wasn't. I mean, sometimes maybe it was, but uh, it really wasn't a, like a rager or like, a, you know, the party still grinding on um, kind of fest. It really was like, hey, relax, man. We got couch cushions and place to chill. And it's kind of this realization that it's hard to go home after these things, uh, especially for me it was. So having more like-minded folks around to kind of talk and, you know, even if it wasn't like intentional integration, I think it contributed to some of that kind of integration for the substances that we were all taking and playing with, you know, in that, in that moment with the music, it's more of this like primal connection to the music and the community. You you don't always have time for the introversion and the conversations that might be needed to sort of get around that. And, um, uh, my intro to psychedelia was very personal and private before I had moved to Minneapolis. I had tried acid and mushrooms a few times and, done them alone and had some experiences that were like borderline chaos like very hard to stomach and kind of ruminating a lot or trying to write and getting stuck on things you know in hindsight I realized it was trauma and baggage and kind of you know acceptance that was happening throughout that but then seeing these other folks and being with people that were going through the same thing or that weren't that could just maintain that positive smile the whole way through it was exactly what I needed, man. It was like, uh, it was medicine at the time and it's still, act, it's like long lasting um, for me at least. I look back on it as like, uh, I didn't, maybe didn't appreciate those days enough. Um, not, not that I want to have some wild after parties all the time here uh, with the family now, but uh, man, it was a good time. And uh, I think it was a, just a wonderful way to like remove the judgment, remove any kind of outside interpretations and just be in the moment kind of be there yeah yeah you know um i've had like two different stages or phases of my life uh with psychedelics you know in my 20s i was hippie flipping candy flipping you know just combining all sorts of <laughs> <Sir>. <laughs> party drugs together and you know like you i mean it's interesting because when I look back, I'm like, oh, it was very unintentional, you know, the way I was taking them. But I was like extrapolating like a lot of learnings. But a lot of the learnings that I would get, I would go, well, I was like super high. Like I, I wasn't too sure like if these were like <laughs> just me thinking like these were valuable learnings or if they were actual valuable learnings. But as I uh, got reconnected with psychedelics in my 40s, I started understanding, oh, okay, like when you intentionally take these things, you know, like one of my guides had told me, like, if if you ever encounter like a rough patch, you know, instead of trying to resist it or to think about something else, like surrender to it. And I remember I had some like really yeah. tough, like when you were saying like ruminating about the same thing, like I've had like six, seven hour acid trips of just thinking about like the relationship between me and my brother and, and wishing it oh, would be dude. better and just you know, like trying to think about something else, but then the medicine just kept on showing like, you know, the relationship with my brother. And when I had done psychedelics in my forties and my brother came up, you know, I surrendered to it. And immediately it was kind of like showing like, oh, you know, like this is how you could reconnect with your brother. This is how you can hold space for him so that he can discuss right. the things that he needs to discuss without either of you being triggered. And it was like really amazing to do psychedelics with a much more intentional um, perspective. And, you know, in a way, like, even though I had done a lot of psychedelics, I, I was never spiritually connected. I just thought, okay, this was a cool experience. Um, you know, but now I'm sober. Now I'm back in the real world. And I don't know about you, but yeah. as in my second phase of connecting with these plants, you know, I started, it started kind of showing me that like, actually this physical reality is not base reality. When you take these substances, you're 
kind of taking you to this higher dimensional, higher frequency uh, version of reality. Where Definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I see you nodding your head. So I'm just kind of curious, what kind of role did psychedelics play in your own personal development and in your spiritual development? Yeah, man, that's an interesting, interesting question there, dude. I, uh, if we rewind the clock, man, I grew up very Catholic. Um, went to Catholic school. My uh, One half of my family's German. The other half is Salvadoran. Both cultures, all Catholicism all the way. Uh, around high school, I kind of fell out of the mix there and was pretty much a like outspoken atheist. Um, I, I enjoyed the skepticism side of that in trying to poke holes. And it was questions like when I was younger asking like, well, how did Noah survive in the whale's belly? If it has like digestive juices and everything's going on there, like how did he actually live there? Like I was, you know, bringing too much other knowledge. And I think that the folks I was asking said like, well, he just did. Instead of maybe telling me like, this is an allegory for like, you know, for being tough, for having the willpower and staying true to your beliefs and things like that. And like, I kind of looked at the Bible and a lot of what the Catholic church was doing maybe too literally and did become very devoutly atheist. Um, and even kind of messed up some relationships with folks by being too outspoken, um, uh, and, and kind of became a quiet one at that. But uh, psychedelia did help me to appreciate, you know, something else again. And in, in the, in the, not in like the Abrahamic monotheistic way, but definitely in a, a sense of connection and unity and something higher that's within us all. And I think it, it was with psychedelics I was able to start seeing that, but also the psychedelics maybe helped to clear up some like some blockage and trauma. I had kind of like a long standing depression. And to this day, I have still some weird social anxiety at times in groups where I'm quiet. And I'm a podcast host and talk all the time. But it was like a some stuff I had to get over, I think, to really um, a, appreciate the, the beauty of life, right? And the, the connectivity of everything. Uh, so certain, you know, certain substances, like I was dabbling with LSD, Uh, At first I was like trying to, I was trying to go into the abyss, like go darker and deeper and try to figure out what was there. And like the next time I would want to take more and more and more and try to do that deeper. And it was getting me into just a, a funk, man, a a weird mind state. But then with all the community and the, the good hippies of the bass music scene, I kind of learned how to have more reverence for some of that. And I also had, um, experiences like candy flipping, hippie flipping, like, I don't know what it's called when you have all of those together. Uh, just a one hell of a flip. But um, uh, you know, I'm not like bragging in this way or encouraging people to do this. But I mean, at times we had, you know, a kind of a method. Like you start with your molly, you take about a gram of mushrooms. Then it, it, later in the evening, you take a tab of LSD. You have some ketamine and some cocaine. And like it was just became like everything. Um, within that, obviously, there was a lot of of insanity and kind of shenanigans working their way out. But I found some crazy periods of like solace and like complete connection, like a, like a, like a oneness of some kind. And I mean, when one of the raves, I found my, my way to the forest and just sat and kind of meditated. It was too much. And at the time I was getting deeper into Zen and stoicism so I sat and tried to just say my like, oh, money, pad me, um, like be here now. Uh, and I opened my eyes about halfway through and like 10 other people were sitting there me- meditating with me. It was crazy. And then like I-, I went back into it again. And when I opened them again, like they were gone. And now I don't actually know if they were there in the first place or if it was some kind of sense or like connection to the people around me. It was wild. So I started kind of, you know, the atheism was broke at that point. (laughs) You know, it was, I could still say I have that and I love to be a skeptic. So it's hard for me sometimes to even stop myself from poking holes. But uh, I had a very powerful DMT trip in apartment 113 that really shifted things for me. Um, Some folks came in and they had it and I hadn't tried it. I was still in that kind of like, 
I'm a gung ho psychonaut sort of phase in my life where it's like, hell yeah, dude, throw it on. You know, we put it on a little bowl of sage, took a giant bong rip, and kind of like my life switched a little bit. I found myself in this like black box with about ankle deep water. And I couldn't really understand why I was there, but it was definitely enclosed. Um, some kind of light or illumination came on and behind the walls was this kind of like alien machinery. Like it, it was kind of like gross or organic stuff moving around behind the walls. But the top of the box opened and a, a feminine figure or kind of being picked me up like I was a two-year-old and pulled me out of the box. And far in the distance, I saw this like absolutely beautiful multicolored city like a castle with like radiating like rainbow colors and it, it it was so wonderful to look at yet so intense that I was like almost like leaning back like just blown away man like crying and like I couldn't I wanted to look at it but I it was too much to look at and then boom experience was over for me at that time like that party was over dude I, went, I got a pen and a notebook and was like, I have to write all this down so that I never forget that. And like in hindsight, like, you know, every once in a while I go back into it and kind of look at it or read about other people's DMT experiences. And there are stories of this, like this oneness or this truth. And so if, if you take like kind of my Catholic upbringing and all the other interests I have, I feel like some kind of deity like a mayor in, in catholic words like mary or in other words maybe it's like i don't know shiva or other figures picked me up and showed me heaven for just a second and i think that that kind of made a different type of religion within me where it's not this guy in the sky watching over everything that i think kids grow up thinking it's actually this beauty and this connection within everybody. It was so like kind of in my mind, I see that as like that was in me. That was like I was capable of that the whole time. And I didn't, you know, I never realized that. Um, yeah, man, I, since then, I don't I don't really trip. Uh, not not necessarily since then, but kind of in that time, I sort of went away from like tripping hard and like trying to touch the, the abyss and like really like push my psyche and now I, I do find microdosing and kind of dabbling at times is a great way to remind myself. But um, there's a quote from Alan Watts where it's like something about how like the biologist doesn't spend all of his time with his eye pressed against the microscope. You know, he has to look and see and then go out and live and learn and act on that. And, you know, and, if, and how once Alan has had tripped so many times, he knows the message. He knows what's on the phone call. So he can just acknowledge that the phone is there and it's ringing and doesn't necessarily answer it. Uh, so I don't know, man, that's where I'm at these days. It's kind of this, um, this belief in a supreme being that's, that's within living things. It, it's the consciousness. It's that spark. Yeah. You know, it's uh, less of that maybe organized approach. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you ended that um uh, that with that last sentence, because I was like, what question did I ask Rob to elicit this answer? You know? <laughs> we went through the journey. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I'm so glad we reached out or I reached out. Uh, we definitely are kindred spirits. I mean, like every story that you were just sharing, like I have like a version of that that I went through. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I remember <laughs> that. And I think what I want to key in on the most was you were just talking about there's consciousness and that spark is within all of us. And I, too, had this like crazy DMT experience where it was like the most unfamiliar like visuals that I was getting like wow this is so like different than anything I've ever seen yet it was like the most like familiar feeling and I didn't see Shiva or uh, Mary but I had another like very gentle like feminine energy like just kind of it wasn't rocking me like I it was like rocking Gaia Mother Earth and but then I could feel oh, wow. like that yeah. like and it was just um 
it, it was transcendent. It turned me from like an atheist to someone that was like, okay, maybe there might be something more. And similarly to you, it's like, um, I don't trip super hard anymore. I will do maybe one or two journeys a year with my wife. Um, but I've been really focusing on just cultivating my own meditation practice and like trying to get that spark within me to activate without any exogenous molecules. And I would say yeah. that I'm kind of, when I get into my deep meditations, I'm, I, I compare it to about like one and a half to two grams of mushrooms. Like I kind of start like being able to access these higher dimensional entities. I could ask questions nice and work, man. receive answers. Yeah. And, you know, it's just interesting because, you know, as I'm hearing your story, like that Alan Watts um, or that uh, biologist analogy, I think is, is perfect. Cause I believe without psychedelics, like I just wouldn't have like this framework of like, of like what to expect when I got into deeper meditations, because before I did psychedelics, I would meditate five, 10, 15 minutes a day and be like, well, I guess that was relaxing, but like these downloads <laughs> and these messages that people get, like I've never gotten anything close to that. So it was just kind of like this intellectual concept that I knew other people could achieve. But after doing psychedelics and kind of interacting with these other entities, once they started presenting themselves to me during my meditations, I was like, okay, like I know what this is. It's not and initially, I thought it might have been like schizophrenia or something, you know, like, why am I hearing voices without mushrooms? But they were very kind and gentle. So I was like, well, at least they're, they're kind, gentle voices, you know, as opposed to... It's a nice version. Yeah, yeah. So I guess, um, where, where are you at right now with your, with your spiritual practice? And, and how do you implement that kind of into your day-to-day -day life, especially with all the different, you know, projects that you're involved in? Yeah, man. Oh, good question there. I, uh, so kind of throughout the, throughout the process there, I found my way into tarot as well. Uh, a particularly strong LSD trip had me just really like, like, dude, I'm, I don't know what this is, but I want to know. And you know, after that, I got into tarot deeper. I do like a daily three card spread, just body, mind, spirit. I've got a little, little shuffling routine that's personal, I guess. And then sort of uh, flip the cards. I read both reversed and right side up and I'm not trying to tell the future, just trying to use it as like an introspective tool. I, I think that's the closest thing to a regular practice that I have right now. Um, I, I try to meditate, but damn, it is hard. <laughs> so it's a, can, definitely I've seen your meditative work and you know, you're talking about your, your routines and, and process there. And that's, that's what I'm trying to get to, man. It's like a more regular approach to it, to be able to sit down and disconnect. Because with so many projects and things spinning, like uh, things get anxious real quickly. Or I can feel like I have just so much to do in the next two hours that even if I were three people, it can't be done. Or it, sometimes it almost feels there's too much to do, I can't do anything. And it's that sort of meditative kind of reset or working with the tarot kind of easy does it. Um, I recently learned about box breathing this year. So I've been doing that a lot. Um, just the in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four, in for, and just kind of going around the square. Um, that's been helping me a lot as well. Um, my wife and I have kind of a semi-regular, uh, Saturday microdose, uh, just a little bit of mushrooms to kind of connect and, um, and, and be with one another a little bit in the evening and kind of remember why we're doing it. Uh, we often, we set intentions there, you know, like this is for, you know, this is for our daughter or this is for us to communicate better and kind of cheers, you know, and, uh, just watch a movie or hang out a little bit, kind of low key. But, um, uh, yeah, man, I, as far as like other spiritual practices, um, um, I don't really go to any organized things, I, but I do a, a hell of a lot of reading. So basically anyone that brings up a book or adds it to the list, um, we end up pulling from the library or tracking it down man and i guess my religion of sorts is kind of internal these days and maybe not as um communal yeah outside of talking shop with folks like you yeah you know i mean i i don't belong to any organized religion or organized spiritual group but i do find like yeah if i connect with someone like rob you know like we will talk about things that will help me integrate some of the learnings and you know tarot is something that um my wife 
got into maybe like a year ago. Uh, I see her pull oh, cards cool. and um, and then I've had people pull cards yeah. for me. But for the people listening that aren't familiar with tarot, and to be honest, before my wife started doing it, like I just thought of it as kind of like bullshit, to be honest. Like, all right, what are these people pulling? Yeah. And are they just <laughs> interpreting things that, you know, and they're trying to align them with their lives? But what I've actually, for myself, is like, I was like, well, if that's all it is and it's making you more introspective and it's making you get some insights, then, you know, even if there is nothing metaphysical about it, like to me, that's a win. But as I've myself gotten a little bit more immersed, I started really seeing the value of tarot. So, you know, for the people listening, how would you describe tarot for them? Yeah, man, definitely. I mean, tarot can be given a bad rap because of like association, association with like the hermetic, like the golden dawn and like Aleister Crawley and, and just, and also some just like late night infomercial kind of witches doing like future telling and stuff like that. I, I definitely want to say that there's like a, a line there that you could cross like really believing in your future or looking at that as something that will happen versus maybe just thinking it through. Um, so I think uh, for those who aren't aware, Tarot has uh, the major arcana, which um, is like starts at the fool and goes all the way through. Um, it's actually um, the journey of, uh, of the soul or of, of a human going through processes and learning. And then it also has um, four minor arcana sets. So there's like swords, pentacles, uh, cups, and wands. And the what it is really is just more of a focus on symbols is how I use it. So the, the different books will show you and tell you kind of what a card means or what it may mean, uh, reversed or right side up. And the way that I do my three card spread is, is really... Um, taking that in and yeah using it as kind of like a cognitive behavioral therapy like introspective tool almost to say like wow so this card actually means you know being bold and making the right decisions but reverse it can mean making decisions too fast Mm. like am i am i doing either of those things is there anything happening in my life right now that i've decided too fast is there anything that you know i am championing and being bold um I'm kind of going through it like that. I don't really take, I, and there's probably some tarot people that would cringe at this interpretation, but I, I don't take a lot of the, me, like the true metaphysics part of it seriously per se. It's more like I just use it as like, what should I think about now? Or like kind of what aspects of myself should I take a look at? Um, over time, there are certain cards that I, I like I like have an affinity to them or it feels like, man, this one, like the chariot, um, some of the sevens, I, I, I dig a lot and I always feel happy when I, when they end up in the spread and there's certain cards that have some like negative symbolism, even that, uh, I definitely am like, oh damn, (laughs) it's that darkness again, or it's that, uh, it's that vice or, you know, something like that, that I need to pay attention to. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of a, I guess a personal process, but there's a, an author, I think, I don't remember her first name, but the last name is Greer, uh, G-R-E-E-R, and her book's called Tarot for Yourself. And basically my practice is really built on just going through that over the last few years. Um, dabbled in collecting tarot card decks for a while, but there's just so many out there that I, I don't necessarily do that either. Uh, recently, though, I, um, I've added runes to the divinatory process of mine and i've i've got the eldar futhark um they're sitting in the sun they're actually purifying here so for me to start drawing one um with the tarot i just kind of like the the history of it and like the connection and the symbology um a whole totally different conversation but also connected to the history of like esotericism is i've been looking into freemasonry and into some of the symbology and the stories around that group uh, so it's, yeah, man, it's a, it's a crazy practice. I think you have to be willing to just, um, give it a try. If you'll get, grab a tarot deck, pull a card, read what it means. Sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes I forget for weeks and then I get back to it. Um, but it does keep me, keep me a little bit level and kind of, uh, being aware of myself when I'm not journaling regularly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, can you share an example of, of how tarot has helped you in your life. But before you share that, um, 
I had a, uh, I had an experience once during meditation and in the meditation, it said like everything in your life happens for a reason. Like there is no accident. And in many ways, like when I received that download, you know, like it made me think about like, yeah, you know, you might just think you're randomly shuffling cards and then randomly pulling out cards, you know, but I found each time like there has been something like very impactful to think about whatever they pulled, either like a positive thing or on the negative, like you might be avoiding something or you might be making decisions a little bit too quickly. And, uh, you know, I, I remember thinking like, yeah, well, when I look over in a traffic jam and I see someone like, is that like, you know, was that meant to be or like, what's the meaning in that? And they're like, well, yeah, get into the synchronicity of it. Yeah, right? yeah the synchronicity. And then the, yeah. what I received after that was like, well, it might not have been important for you to see that person, but perhaps that person that saw you, it reminded him that he needed to get milk before he went home or whatever. And by getting milk <laughs> before he goes home, he's not going to be sleeping on the couch that night. And, you know, it just kind of made me think like, yeah, you know, like what if you did think everything was happening for you for a reason? And when I thought it through, I was like, even if it's not true, you know, to me, it's like a useful way to live life. And so you were talking about, well, maybe even if there's no metaphysical properties to the tarot cards, it is a time to just kind of introspect on like the meaning of the card in the context of like what's going on in your life. And so with that long little preamble I just gave, I'd love yeah. to hear how um, tarot has, Definitely, man. has helped you. Yeah, like the like one of the cards I mentioned, the chariot uh, is one that I uh, hold I hold dear, and what it mean what it can mean is really you know perseverance um, and having the self determination to kind of keep going, the confidence to to do what you're doing, overcoming obstacles, and I mean whether my obstacles were like you know these significant things or I just made them significant in my head, I'm good at building obstacles, <laughs> and sometimes crappy at getting over them. Um, so the chariot has, you know, helped me to, uh, if I see that, I feel like emboldened, you know, I'm on the right path or, um, because the way I do the three is a body, mind, spirit. So it's kind of like reading in that line, like, uh, how am I doing physically? Like, am I running or maintaining a good diet, that kind of thing versus am I thinking correctly and, you know, having good thoughts, um, or spiritually, you know, do I need to try to connect with anything else? Uh, I think that card is one of the most powerful for me, but, um, I am not one that can pull the tarot and just like tell you like, Oh, you've got the four of cups. It means X, Y, Z. I still look it up in my book and, uh, reading through it. But, um, I, I think that it's not necessarily that the tarot has been helpful at the, in the time or in the moment. It just helps to sort of frame the day, almost like a, like a gratitude journal or mm. like a daily journal to just get, a little vibe check internally and kind of see how things are. There are times when I've uh, been shuffling and like a card will fall out. I definitely use that card. That's it's the idea is kind of like it was meant to fall out. It was like you dropped one like, Oh, it was, you know, it was the tower. Like, all right, what, what kind of decisions do you need to make to either avoid um, some kind of sweeping change or what kind of sweeping change do you need to like try to get ready for? And I don't know if I have really strong, like, you know, like life correlations, like, man, one time I drew this card and I got a promotion or, you know, that kind of thing. It's just always been this sort of sounding board um, that uh, is kind of always there, there for you. And honestly, as you learn it, it's one of those things that you can just go deeper into. Uh, I have a, like a deep interest in just systems. As a kid, I would just read like rule books for RPGs and like, games and things like that, I would read them and understand the rules more than I would actually want to play them. And uh, I, I think there's just always this kind of search for knowledge and trying to understand systems. Mm. And, the, and the tarot presents a very deep system with so many interpretations, different decks have different kind of origins. Um, you can get really into the historical side to kind of learn about some of the imagery that stems from like Egyptian times. Um, you can look at like how some of the imagery relates to the Kabbalah, the tree of life, or even astrological things. Um, it's kind of just there to explore and kind of stimulate. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Um, it sounds like to me it, it, it's part of like your morning routine. Kind of like some people drink coffee or some green juice. You do the tarot, yeah. and it's not necessarily like – like, because I pulled these cards, X, Y, Z happened. It's more of like, hey, this is part of something that keeps me in a high state of being, in a high frequency, and allows me to kind of introspect and get a good kind of holistic view of what's going on in my life from mind, body, and spirit. Yeah, man, definitely. And um, like for some significant events for my wedding, um, for the birth of my daughter, I did a bigger spread. And kind of being so caught up in those events I didn't really even interpret it I took a picture and sometime I'd like to come back to that spread and see like how it's applied over time maybe what was what was it foreshadowing anything or what connections did it have to those those big moments yeah. but I know some folks get into like a very um, like elaborate spreads like you know multiple cards like certain cards can mean you know future certain cards can be relations and things that you you know or you don't know, um, haven't gotten that deep. Uh, the only other thing I'd add is that the imagery of the cards too help from kind of a th- like a therapeutic way. I like to look at the three and see how they would be interacting. I learned that from that uh, Tarot for Yourself book. Kind of seeing, like, okay, the King of Cups, he's kind of looking to the right at the, the hanged man. Like, why would he be, he's acknowledging his, is he acknowledging something? Is he judging that? And then kind of like, Next to them is the, you know, seven of swords. What's going on in that picture that might be like related, trying to connect mm. it. Um, and yeah, it's kind of like almost like a story prompt kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, <laughs> you talking about like your infatuation with systems, even as a kid is, is pretty interesting to me. Um, are you familiar with a model of consciousness called spiral dynamics? No, I think uh, actually I heard a little bit of you talking about it though recently on this on spiral dynamics though is that a um, is that similar to like the eight circuit model? Um, what is the eight circuit model? Okay, uh, tangent. Uh, eight circuit model is the uh, uh, model of consciousness that Timothy Leary proposed, and you have these four circuits that are imprinted on you as you as you grow. Um, they're based on like certain things like kind of Freudian almost like your attachment with your mother your first experiences romantically like how culture treated you they make these imprints and that those imprints over your consciousness kind of um, affect how you live and certain people can be stuck in one or more circuits or have some issues with the circuit that kind of affects their uh, their personality or their mind state and then the four higher circuits are not uh, they're called higher, but they're not necessarily stacked. It's just these uh, the circuits six, uh, f- five, six, seven, and eight are all um, maybe getting in more into the metaphysical. Mm. And there's like he he kind of proposed, and people have evolved on it now, and to associate different psychedelic mind states with different circuits, like six. And I might get this wrong here, but I think six is like more like the cannabis kind of high and like vibes like that, and more of like the hedonistic say like hedonistic parties for hedonistic sakes um where the like circuit eight is a dmt experience right right and it's kind of like how these accessing these higher circuits help you meta program and change your imprints Mm. from before if anything it's sort of like a i guess it's kind of like another way to look at what we now would call like um the the neuroplasticity of psychedelics and kind of how people are able to truly change their ego when they get those releases um, and things like that. Uh, that's super cool. That, but yeah, there's definitely some overlap between that and spiral dynamics. Uh, spiral dynamics also yeah. has uh, eight eight stages to it. And similarly, the higher stages don't necessarily mean a better stage. It just means that there's like more granularity of thought in these higher stages. And oh, interesting. And there's two tiers, uh, t- uh, tier one and tier two. Stages one through six, uh, tier one, um, the common bond between the first tier is that everyone believes if more people thought like me, the world would be a better place. So 
Um, one tier is the black and white thinking. So it's like, hey, if everyone was a Christian or everyone was like a Muslim, the world would be a better place. Then there's stage five, which is like the achiever stage, which is like my self-worth is connected to my achievements. So in that stage, it's like, well, if everyone just worked hard and achieved more, the world would be a better place. And then stage six, which is the last tier of tier one, is you realize that chasing these external things never brings you long-term happiness. And then you start going within yourself and you're like, well, if everyone just got ultra spiritual, the world would be a better place. And you, and each of these stages kind of like, as you transcend, you kind of look at the previous stage like, oh man, I was like so immature or so naive to think that way. Oh, interesting. But um, the whole reason why I brought up the systems is when you get to tier two, uh, stage seven and stage eight thinking, which according to spiral dynamics, less than 1% of the population is in, is that stage seven is the first stage where you realize like, all of these stages are required. So like you can't get to college if like 12th grade isn't more important than ninth grade if you want to go to college. They're, they're just kind of foundational. They build on top of each other. And that... Yeah, they're requirements. Correct, correct. And that there is truth in everything, but depending on what stage you're in, some things will be more true than others. Um, hmm. Ooh, I'm going to have to read about that deeper, man. That sounds great. Yeah, and and then so yeah. in this stage seven tier two thinking, you no longer look at like humans as good or bad. You just look at like what systems do people come from? You know, like I live in California. I'm in San Francisco. Hey, no big surprise. Sabo is a progressive person, right? But if Sabo was born in the deep south, would I be the same progressive person so you start just looking at things as like expansive systems or contractive systems and so yeah when you brought that up that even as a kid you were thinking about systems I was like oh man I really need to communicate to Rob that you know I think from a very early age you know source energy kind of blessed you with this like thinking of like instead of just looking at like the micro let's kind of zoom out to the macro and see how the system is actually affecting everything and i believe that when you get into systems thinking then you know man i don't even want to talk about this but yeah it's like obviously someone uh, trump was uh, uh there was an attempted assassination right and on social media there's tons of people yeah. saying like he's like the bravest person or this was a hoax or, you know, very heavy, Chaos heavy opinion. on the medias. <laughs> but I believe if yeah. you're a systems thinker, you just start thinking systemically, like when something like this happens, you know, what happens to society? And at least for me, kind of thinking of it from a systemic point of yeah. view, like has calmed my nervous system down to still be able to access my higher levels of cognitive consciousness and yeah i was kind of curious after i shared that with you did anything come up for you oh definitely man that sounds that sounds like a great worldview and i think um something that you know would would benefit folks to think about where they're at in the system it's interesting with the with that kind of thinking and you know with like a path to knowledge in quotes you have to care actually about trying to have that knowledge you know if you if you don't care, you're probably down in those lower tiers forever. It, and it doesn't feel like anything's wrong. And maybe there's not anything inherently wrong with it. But uh, it's kind of, um, you know, you mentioned the social media side and the politics piece. Like, oh, I have a strong, like, stoic, stoicism, like, angle there where I try to stay far away. Like, kind of be as apolitical as I can be and try not to get sucked into the into the machine so much but yeah i think that to explore those systems deeper or to zoom out zoom in and kind of really have that approach you have to care and you know actually want to see what's out there i kind of liken it to like if you played like uh like strategy games on the computer there's like a fog of war like you don't know what's over there but you know something is there like past those mountains it you have to send a unit up there to see to actually understand it you know it's kind of a an analogy for it i think and then you also have to be humble epistemically so this idea of like epistemic humility um came from a book that's called the impact of the black swan um and or i think it's like the impact of the highly um, unprobable by nasim talib 
something about a black swan in the title. And he talks about how you have to be willing to just shift your knowledge and your mind state and what you know and your thoughts constantly. You have to take that new information and adapt and adjust and be willing to shake up the foundations if you just suddenly realize like not all swans are white. There's a blue swan. Well, that that idea that swans are white now is that's gone. Um, you know, or there's a that when they finally found black swans, it kind of shifted the the knowledge. Uh, so I think it's yeah, it takes a certain mindset there, but also it could be argued that it's well, it could be frivolous if it's just like kind of intellectual exploration and personal. But if you look at kind of how society changes, if individuals change, and you know if enough people think a certain way, the society tends to follow. I think that's where it gets more powerful. And I think, you know, spreading the words there and trying to make people aware of what's possible and try to build that, that need to care. That's the, that's the million dollar problem. And I think that's what podcasts like this one are doing. man. Yeah. You know what you just said about like, if enough people think about something, that's the reality, you know, it reminded me of, I can't remember which book it was in, but they talked about that there was three types of reality. There was objective reality. It's 73 degrees outside. Uh, There's subjective reality. Uh, Rob thinks 73 is hot. Sabo thinks it's cold. And then there's intersubjective reality, which is if enough people believe Bitcoin is worth a lot of money, it's worth a lot of money. If enough people think Birkenstocks or, (laughs) or bell bottoms are trendy, then it is trendy. That is the reality. And I remember after reading that, they said like intersubjective reality makes up like the vast majority of the reality that we live in. And it did very much make me think, wow, you know, like, like very few things are objective reality and the rest of life is pretty much intersubjective reality. So, you know, when I was on my spiritual journey, a lot of like what I was thinking was like, this is, this is really good for me, you know, and I didn't want to push my beliefs onto other people, but you know, over the last three years, I had been meditating um, roughly about 90 minutes a day, just every day. Um, I took a break from wow. cannabis yeah. and really was trying to refine hey. myself. And I'm on day 60 of a tolerance break today. Oh, are you? Oh, awesome. Yeah, which is oh, my record is 87. So I don't mean to, to tangent, but okay, yeah, taking a break. I think the industry does glamorizes constant consumption. Yeah, yeah. And actually, what I meant was I was out of the industry for three years. But of those three years, I took a one year break from cannabis. And um, in nice. one of my meditations, it said that, hey, Sabo, like, it's great that you feel very much in alignment, and that everything is peaceful for you. But you didn't like incarnate into 3d physical reality to just you know, sit on your homestead and meditate. You're meant to really interact and be with people and to share your thoughts and not in a dogmatic way, but just share the thoughts. And if they like them, great. If they don't like them, great, you know? And then that was kind of like this impetus of getting back into the cannabis industry. And it's kind of interesting, you know, like when you have like a good, like you have your chief product officer title. Uh, I'm basically a CPO, but they let me call it chief innovation officer. It's like, wow, you know, it's like so many more people listen when you have like this nice title behind your name versus, you know, the guy that's sitting out on his homestead, just meditating and putting out inspirational content. Right, right. It's kind of like the Buddha, right? He's, he was enlightened and he went back to live and, and kind of take that, didn't keep sitting and and basking in the enlightenment right yeah got to share the share the knowledge but yeah man so many uh, uh so many good things to talk about there the the cpo side and like the agile coaching piece that i do that's all because of that love of systems as well that kind of just um pulled me in um, and i like to set up better systems operationally and kind of I'm, like i mentioned with that weird skepticism angle of mine i can poke holes fast and um, sometimes too fast so sorry to, to clients and folks that I've done that too, but I'm always ready to fix it and try to implement these systems of to make good products or make good teams. That's the fun part, man, for sure. Yeah, you know, I was thinking like, um, how have you applied systems to your own life? You know, I'm sure like, you know, life before being a parent and then life after being a parent requires a whole different set of systems. So I'm, I wanted to ask you, oh, you yeah. know, are you, are you <laughs> applying uh, systems thinking into your own life? Yeah, folks that know me privately, like I'm very routine. I do set things in the morning 
or in the night. I do set things on Tuesdays. I have a gym routine or a running routine and kind of like my process. And if it, if I fall out of that process, things start to get kind of awry or I forget things or, you know, mess up. Um, so I, I stick to the calendar. I live by that religiously. <laughs> That's my religion, I guess, unfortunately, is uh, just scheduling things ahead. And um, using Trello is a, like a task, as like almost a task management board for me. So when I have so many things going, I can pull like two into tomorrow. And then even though I have all this other crap that uh, I can't even list, it's longer than my arm, it's, it's like tomorrow I can do those two things. Um, that's really helped me, I think, um, as far as like life before and after um, becoming a father, it's definitely changed, man. I uh, don't have the big blocks of focus time that I, I used to have, and maybe I wasn't grateful for. Um, I, maybe I was even bored. So there's some aspect where, you know, my little daughter, she'll come over and just be standing here seeing what I'm doing. And it's like, dude, I would, this is great. And I'll, of course, I'll stop what I'm doing and get back to this later tonight. So it, it has created like a weirder schedule for me but uh, my wife is very supportive there and like helping me to get accomplish things and you know stay on task that uh, we're able to keep a good balance but um, man without a schedule and trying to have a plan for the day I'd be uh, I'd be uh, lost in chaos man <laughs> how old yeah. is your daughter now uh, she's 18 months oh man that's awesome yeah, so it's just, walking and babbling and uh learning some sign language and a few starter words it's been a lot of fun man i um i always knew that i wanted kids i think in in some sense but i didn't know i and maybe this sounds bad to say i didn't know if i really did um but now i i, I realize yeah it was true I, I like this a lot and you know nothing makes me happier it's like i'm trying to sleep in sleeping in for me is like 6 45 in the morning but uh see her little face like poking on the bed trying to play peekaboo with me at like 6 or 5 45 is like oh hey come on up man this is awesome yeah you know i, I wouldn't i wouldn't take it back yeah it, it's <laughs> definitely awesome seeing uh your kids and my kids are 13 and 9 i i remember when they were 18 months it was oh they were man. just so cute and i remember just being so like i love sleeping or i hate being like awoken like while i'm sleeping but you know when i would just see <laughs> yeah. like their little faces it would instantly make me so happy and i think the best advice i got from parenting uh, this one guy just said the nights are long, but the years are short. And now that I have a teenager where she's wearing my wife's clothes, I'm like, yeah, he was totally right. I went from being like one of the young parents to like one of the older parents at school, you know, uh, it's been <laughs> such a trip. Yeah. And what else? Oh, oh man. Yeah, dude, I got, I got to learn from you there. I'll, I'll definitely, we'll have some more stories as, uh, as she grows up, I think, um, 13, man, that's when. As I, I know she's cute now, but even I know eventually she's going to get this attitude of mine. The skepticism is going to be inherited. <laughs> yep, yep. And, you know, I mean, I think that I've just taken all of these as learning experiences, meaning like, you know, I wasn't prepared to be a father. I remember when my wife told me she was pregnant, like I wanted kids. But the second she told me, I was like, I guess it's on now, you know, and like this switch kind yeah. of flipped in my mind and I was like am I going to be ready or not but I've come to realize it is the thing that brings me the most amount of joy in this life is you know watching these little people like develop into whoever they're going to be and I guess this might be a really good segue into the last question I usually typically ask which is I love to open up the floor you know we talked about a lot of different things but what is like the most important thing or what's top of mind for you that you would like to communicate to the audience? Yeah, man, definitely. Excellent question. I love that you have this at the closing. Um, I, I think it's really epistemic humility, like I mentioned, like the unknown unknowns. Be willing to um, accept new information and sometimes even search for it. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's it. And that and, you know, working on stoicism on my side, realize what's inside your circle of control. Yeah. Worry about that, you know, and make sure that you don't put in an, an inordinate amount of worry and anxiety on things that are well outside of it, which those circles can be different for everyone. But I mean, you know, when it's, you know, worrying about something far away or something that's just completely out of your power is like not a good use of resources and times. 
kind of stay focused, stay humble. Oh man, I love that. And you know, I told you like I had burnt out from the cannabis industry from 2020 to 2023. And a big reason of that was I was taking on in my mind, like the responsibility of the entire industry feeling like if this, if I don't do this, it's going to go awry. If I don't support this person, it's going to go awry. If I don't do this, it's just going to be, you know, three MSOs and the rest of everyone is fucked, you know, and just really like holding on to yeah. like that as like my responsibility versus just really realizing the only thing I could really control is like myself and how I use my time and to just trust that everyone else can do the same and hope that that would, you know, shift and point us in a direction that we all would love to see for our industry. Definitely, man. Yeah. And, um, uh, that's a whole nother episode getting into the cannabis <laughs> space because I go, I go in and out of like burnout periods, um, especially with my role being like very introverted on the software side. Sometimes I kind of forget the larger community at play and it's like, I have to go to conferences and be reminded of that or work with good folks like fat nugs and like actually connect purposefully. Otherwise I feel like I'm, I, sometimes like nihilistic almost like I don't why am I doing this you know what is this actually for I've been, so I, I can relate on that side <laughs> I've been there and you know the by the way I just noticed the X-Men posters in the background those are pretty dope um, oh yeah I'm a huge comic book nerd and sci-fi nerd man the X-Men are my go-to yeah. you know <laughs> as I was saying you know I'm no stranger to having these same types of thoughts and what am I doing it for and you know what I realized at least for me on my spiritual journey was it showed me that um, our purpose, my purpose, your purpose, all of our purposes is to be as present as possible when we're living life. You know, like if our lives were meant to just be lived in our heads, um, you know, that would be a completely different type of existence. And as long as we could be present and grateful for the things that we do, you know, that is a purpose driven life. And, you know, I feel like not that I'm here, we didn't meet for a particular, or it's not that we met for this particular reason, but I do feel that a lot of the people that I do link up with in the cannabis space, you know, having spent, having to like leave the industry for a few years and then come back, I do feel that many of my connections is like, so that I could share my burnout story and, you know, just give people like extra yeah. mana or life force to, to push through. For real. Yeah, man. And uh, yeah, I've got to hear your story next. Dude. We got to get you on the podcast for Apartment 113 yes. and, and talk all about the history there. That would be great. Absolutely. So with that said, you know, uh, for people that want to find you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so you can connect on, on LinkedIn. Um, Instagram is APT underscore 113. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm terrible at social media. I'm there. I will respond. Um, but you can go to apartment113.com and you can find the podcast kind of wherever podcasts are found, I'll be there. Um, if you want to check out Toke from the dispensary software side of things, the website's gotoke.io, and I'd be happy to give you a demo on that front. Oh, awesome, awesome. Well, Rob, thank you so much for connecting. I'm so glad that I uh, somehow stumbled upon Dustin's Fat Nug, so we were able to connect, and I am super stoked to come on your podcast. That was actually, I was hoping like you would ask, so the fact that you asked made me feel <laughs> really man. happy, and man, I'm glad that... Uh, I mean, for those listening, like me and Rob never met each other. This is the first time we're actually having a conversation and I feel like just really like comfortable at home with you. So I really look forward to kind of um, experiencing Great, more things yeah. with you and, and uh, learning more about you and your family. Hey, thank you, Sabo. I really appreciate it, man. All right, everyone. Uh, take care. I'm going to leave all of uh, Rob's um, contact info in the show notes. And Rob, thank you again for joining the show.